adjust some of my audio. I think that should be good. Yeah. So this is going to be a short break stream. I kind of wanted just uh, <laughs> This is the first time I actually kind of wanted to stream when I probably shouldn't be. I should be uh, <clears throat> resting my throat. I got sick over the past week, um, and my throat hurt like crazy over the weekend. But um, I took the time, I rested in my bed, and uh, I read through um, a book I had uh, by my bedside that I bought a while ago, and uh, just kind of had it in the background for me to read at you know, an opportune moment. And, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> you can hear me still being, being a little sick. But yeah, the book I read was uh, this book called Ask Iwata. And um, Iwata is in reference to the late former Nintendo president. Um, This was something that I picked up because I have a an interest in video game development. Uh, not so much from the side of programming, although um, that that field's interesting too. But more about the managerial and the, the history of it. And you can find a lot of interesting aspects about project development from all these different video game uh, histories and how like each individual game was actually made. And I, f I find it interesting uh, mostly because I like applying those principles, these uh, principles used in management of these projects and kind of applying them into my own life for self-improvement. Um, and so Satoru Iwata he was a big, he was a big name. Probably not as much as us, of um, as the developers. So um, when you think about like Nintendo, um, you think about like Miyamoto. So like the guy who actually came up with Mario and Zelda. And Iwata was more of like, so he was the president of Nintendo, and he was the guy that. Um, actually managed the different teams and um, told the different departments uh, like okay well here's what you need to do for this project and here's where we should go in the direction of Nintendo. Now although he's a little bit more understated, you know, he's a reason why we have stuff like the Wii and the Nintendo DS which are you know very very eccentric um, designs to making video game hardware but he was a programmer as well but all right, yeah, so that's enough uh, of the intros. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The other thing I wa <coughs> wanted to do was <coughs> play a little bit of Tetris Effect. Let me get the laws in here. Oh, my goodness. I do not want to play multiplayer. <sighs> um, let's see. Let's play some chill marathon Tetris Effect. I just started, um, there should be a random button on here if there's, there is. Um, let's do Dolphin Surf. I don't know how, I don't remember this level. So I also played this um, over the weekend. Shoot, and I remapped my <laughs> my controls. So <coughs> <coughs> man, I really should have streamed. All right, so oh my gosh, so I. I changed the up key to uh, um, 
hard drop. But the default is rotate, so that's why I am messing up pretty, pretty bad here. Alright, hard drop, hard drop. Um, so before I go back to ASCII Wado, <coughs> I'll talk about <coughs> a little bit about Touch Effect. <coughs> So Tetris had like a really nice, I don't want to call it resurgence, but um, I guess creative game design is how I would phrase it. Uh, because we've had the amazing Tetris 99 and um, Puyo Puyo Tetris, and I, like honestly they're incredibly innovative, like all of them, and uh, Tetris Effect was like the last of these new Tetris games that I didn't really get into, mostly because of the price point. Um, it's pretty expensive for a, a Tetris game, um, and I was, when I saw it on, um, <coughs> 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 Game Pass, like, I knew I had to play it right away, because I was, you know, this is definitely on my alley. I think it's, a, uh, yeah, I think it's a really great game, um, a great version of Tetris, which focuses more on, uh, this version of, uh, Tetris focuses more on, like, the visuals and audio, as you can see. The guy who designed it was the guy behind like Res Infinite, and um, there's another like big video game that he did that was kind of in the same style of these like this, you know, this electronic kind of like uh, electro techno uh, visuals and audio. Like, I think it's, the, the way he designs things is like, it almost feels like the games that he makes is like him trying to bridge the world between, um, being, like, human versus, like, like, being in the machine. It's very, like, opposite of The Matrix because it's like a very... It's like a positive, chill vibe to it. But yeah, so, um... Yeah, I had a really enjoyable time with this, uh... With this version of Tetris. Um, and I think... Um, I think it has a lot more appeal for... People who are interested in a more casual or casual players that are interested in just trying out Tetris again. Because like the interesting audio and visuals just like make the game a lot sexier to try out compared to Puyo Puyo or Tetris 99. I was one of those players too that um, before I had started playing, like really um, giving Tetris a shot, which was maybe about a year ago. Um, no, longer than that, maybe two years ago. But it was just like, okay, well, it's Tetris. Um, there are no like, there are no like hard objectives, um, and I don't understand the meaning behind just playing this game versus like playing another game where there's like clear defined objectives and uh, you're going to be rewarded with interesting story or you know a sequence of events, cinematic cutscene. But after getting to play it, um, I just like a couple years ago, like it's it is an addictive game and um, the sort of interesting fun to be had just like zoning out and just like 
yeah, just basically zoning out, not thinking too hard about this kind of stuff. I'll see if I can. I don't think that's possible. I'm not going to try it. Um, so yeah, so I got into Tetris 99, uh, Puyo Puyo Tetris first, because that was like the surprise hit at an anime convention that I went to before. Um, at anime conventions, they have all these, uh, they have like a video game room where they feature all these usually multiplayer games for people to interact with and have fun. Just like, hey, here's Smash Brothers, or here's, uh, um, a fighting game, shooter, whatever, multiplayer game, you know, play it, um, and talk to some strangers. Um, and at one of the earlier conventions I went to, which was, um, uh, I want to say this convention was like, years ago or something like that, Puyo Puyo Tetris was like, everybody wanted to play it, which was so confusing to me because I was like, it's Tetris. Oh man. Um, but once I actually gave it a try, like a try, like I could understand the appeal a lot better. Like, it gets, um, single players, like it's fun, it's like something that you relax to, but, uh, competitive <laughs> Tetris players, like, it gets intense, and it's fun, because, like, you, you know the rules, and, like, it's easy to visualize, like, what is supposed to happen, and if you've messed up or not. So, like, seeing the tiles build up without, like, me being able to clear them, you can kind of have a sense of, like, where I'm at. Yeah, so I got into Puyo Puyo Tetris. That was a lot of fun. Um, and then as soon as I played at the end of the convention, like, I bought it right away on my Switch. <clears throat> um, and then afterwards, um, a little while later, um, I gave Tetris 99 a shot, which I believe I've sunk in more hours into that than Puyo Puyo Tetris, and Puyo Puyo Tetris I sucked in like maybe 20 to 30 hours in there, which um, is a lot for a lot for me for a game that you know, doesn't have like story sequences in it. Um, yeah, and so this was like the next like Big Tetris game during this period of like, oh, you gotta try this out. And I was eager to, but like, um, it just cost a lot in the beginning. It was like, I don't know how much it costs now, but I think it was like something like 40 bucks for a single player only because at that time, this didn't have any like multiplayer. Um, it was just very expensive for, um, for like a consumer that's like not, um, specifically into like enhanced audio, visuals, or Tetris. After playing it, I think it's a great game. Um, and with the added like, uh, multiplayer that they did with, I think this is like the connected version. Um, I think it's a solid buy if you're, if you have, like, if you're interested in trying to do, like, multiplayer things, like, multiplayer matches with your friends. I think it's a solid buy. Um, but, that's, like, one of the things where, I know I've heard that in many reviews, uh, looking into games where, like, oh, okay, well, you should get this game for, it's, like, good multiplayer, but, um, Actually, having a chance to do multiplayer stuff. Um, oh shit, it's going really quickly now. Um, actually, having time to uh, try to do, multi uh, do multiplayer with friends, resolve the different options that are available to you. Um, it's still tough. 
but like, you know, with Game Pass, uh, like, it's an easy, like, no brainer to just, like, try it out, have a good experience with it. So I beat, like, the normal mode single player, which is just going through all the different stages. It's just a very um, sensory-based game. Oh man. The, the one thing I will say that kind of sucks about this version is that it does feel compared to like my time spent, um, my time spent with like, oh my gosh, this, there's no game over? Oh, okay. Well, let's just exit out there and go to a different stage. Um, it feels like there is a little bit of... I don't want to call it lag, but... Like, you saw it there where, like, my intention was to bring one of the blocks over to the left and then rotate it, but it just, like, it wouldn't go to the left. So there's a little bit of a delay there that I haven't experienced when I played in, like, 99 or Puyo Puyo Tetris. So I think there's a slight little bit of delay with... Uh, Tetris effect. If you're like super concerned about um, how the gameplay stacks up, Let's look. I got some chicken and gumbo soup with me, so I have to take a bite. Mm, that's good. So yeah, I think the the big appeal for me like was. I was trying out the different stages. Ferris Code is the one I played twice, maybe. Metamorphosis, that's like the last like ultimate level. We'll do Ferris Code. Oh, downtown jazz. Right, is that what you would do Ferris Code? I kind of like this one um, because there's a little bit of uh, hip hop with it, but the vocals aren't actually That present for long. <sighs> so yeah, the, I think the main appeal for me was just like playing through all the different stages. Um, but I mean, there's a ton of different modes in here to um, to try out. I mean, it's, it's pretty feature rich at this point. Um, but yeah, uh, the other thing I wanted to just like talk about because it was on my mind was that ASCII Wada book. So I kind of got really excited talking about it at the beginning of uh, the stream. But basically, yeah, so I've been wanting to read this book. Um, and I just had a good time since I had a, like, I knew I should have stayed in bed and everything. Um, so I stayed in bed and read this book. Um, surprisingly, I liked it a lot and started saying like uh, some interesting things that it, uh, it talked about with um, I guess game like business management. So one of the things when I think about business management is like I start I think about like how ruthless business management can be. I mean that's the stuff that you see on TV. It's just like everyone is like very cutthroat. Um, you know, bad bosses. Uh, you know, the hard working employees that like pull all nighters and stuff. Um, and I think that's very like westernized concept of like uh, of business management and how to like how managers will take on the roles but it's interesting saying like how um, Awada who's like the president of Nintendo and how he said that he did his style of management which ultimately was 
Uh, it absolutely was one of the reasons for Nintendo's successes, especially during uh, the 2000s, I would argue. Um, he was he was a, a president of HAL Laboratories, which is the company behind Kirby and Smash Brothers. And in fact, this is something I didn't know after reading the book, but like, uh, it, it went into it in the book. He was the guy that actually programmed Smash Brothers. Um, we talked about how him and Sakurai um, discussed like the the idea of Smash Brothers and he came up with like an interesting concept. And Sakurai was the guy that <coughs> <coughs> planned out what should happen and like how it'd be cool and everything. Um, what would make the gameplay interesting. It was actually uh, Iwata who did actual coding and everything. And not only Smash Brothers, but he did the programming for uh, for Mario Kart. So the other big Nintendo multiplayer game. So Iwata was, you know, he was a uh, pretty actual fire dude. Uh, but the interesting thing about his... <coughs> 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 management style was that he was actually a super positive person. He was like kind of like the um, nice guy boss. Um, I think that's like, it gets a lot of flack. If you're into um, understanding business management, like, you know that that's not kind of how um, a lot of managers like <coughs> learn, <coughs> practice being managers. A lot of times, uh, they tend to be hard asses because I think they've done studies showcasing that, like, um, <coughs> that a lot of times being uh, a rude manager actually does get things done because people tend not want, like, tend not to want to disappoint you. But the thing is, like. That study didn't count for, when I was like going over it, didn't account for um, turnover rate. Because obviously if you're going to, if you're a bad manager, um, the worker like turnover rate's going to increase. And so sure enough, you're going to have uh, quicker and arguably better short-term results, but long-term results are not great. And if you apply like lessons of, uh, value investing, like, you'll find out that the best businesses that investors will want to invest in are the ones that actually have the best, like, long-term, uh, long-term, uh, consistency. So, it's one of those interesting, uh, things in terms of making, uh, business decisions and trying to figure out, like, best managerial styles. It's like, do you want to have like one of those managers that are really rough on their employees and are able to get uh, quicker short-term results or, or do you want a manager that's going to be able to consistently perform and uh, have those consistent, uh, you know, consistent results. I think it's an interesting um, fudge, uh, economics question, or MBA question. Alright, let's see how we get out of this. Alright. Yeah, I like the, so I like the visuals, like, are, uh, pretty good. Um, I almost, when I was playing this, I almost was, like, thinking, like, it's not actually anything all that special to you know, people who are into EDM or anything like that, because you're going to see stuff like this all the time. But like, how many game developers are actually going to make this type of game, like, combine, like, Tetris with this style of game? It's just like, not many. And so you kind of have to appreciate the, like, the developers who, um, 
take the risk to make these type of games. So like, you know, um, there's a lot of respect there to like actually have a vision for something, even though you know players like myself aren't necessarily going to be on board with it 100. Um, percent But like to have a vision and stick with it. Um, it's not easy holding on to something, like, holding on to certain values, um, because a lot of times, uh, especially in the world today, it's like, for such a results-driven, um, society, that, like, sometimes you abandon these values that are important to you for the sake of getting better results, which, and it, Sometimes it's not a bad thing, but like, it just, it sucks that <clears throat> you can't always, uh, that more times than not, uh, people will go after the result than what they think is right. Alright. Oh man. Oops. Yeah, so I was thinking about um oh, come on. Asked about the Iwata or the book Ask Iwata. And just uh learning how he conducted his book. I I recommend reading the book. Uh, and I feel like I'm just getting like really small these small tidbits compared to like what it um, compared to like what the content actually offers, but just like a really interesting like uh, video game history slash like business management um, uh, book. Okay. Yeah, what I was thinking about was actually the acquisition with uh, with uh, Microsoft and how they just <coughs> bought all this different. Okay, let's let's put out this and how they bought. Um... Mm, let's go to um, bought Activision, and so they have what they have. I remember they have Call of Duty, and it's escaping my mind. Like what else that they got from the um, from buying out Activision, the other franchises. Oh, Blizzard. That's right. So Blizzard games are now like going to be managed by Microsoft. You know, like that's a big thing. Is not so much that these are going to be quote unquote Microsoft games because they're. I don't really think that's going to be the case. Like. All these Blizzard games are still going to be Blizzard, and Call of Duty is still going to be Activision. But I think it's going to be like, okay, it's now going to be managed by Microsoft, which I think is the exciting thing, because Microsoft, they, because they have such a big stakes in the hardware uh, side of things as well, the console market, as well as like their Game Pass, they're concerned about making, like, developing uh, quality games. If you're in it, if you're in the side of the industry where you don't have a stake in a platform, so like the Xbox brand or the Game Pass brand, you're not necessarily going to be interested in making high quality games. You're going to be interested interested in making games that are going to sell um, sell a lot. So that's why they, you know, have that business philosophy of churning out. Um, Call of Duty games like year after year and all that because um, this is this is a principle that you can actually like deduce from um, doing some statistical work and data analytical work on your own. So like for example, I over the past year <coughs> I created an Excel file with all the different games I played and I just. I put different values on them uh, based on all these different categories, including 
uh, sales numbers, uh, how good the critic score was, my own personal score, um, all these different, all these different categories and values. And just for fun, I swore at all of the different games by like the games that by how much they sold, and compared that with um, the different critic scores. So, like taking a look at. <laughs> <clears throat> like how the score breakdown worked for for something like uh, let's say for example like Modern Warfare like the new reboot Modern Warfare and that sold a lot a lot of copies but I think it's I think you would be hard pressed to find someone who but say that, like, okay, Call of Duty's uh, Modern Warfare um, is a 5 out of 5 game that's better than God of War, for example, the reboot of God of War. Although, I think most people would say that the new God of War is a better game than uh, the new Call of Duty. The new Call of Duty is actually the one that sold more copies. So, I mean, that not that, like, an interesting, like interesting relationship, that there is actually not a strong correlation between the quality of the game and its sales numbers. Of course there is a correlation, but it's just not a strong one, it's not a direct one. And so these game companies, like Western game companies in particular, like they use data, like they've been using data analytics for a long time now, and they found from their data that, you know, they can make like a not, like a 4 out of the 5 game and still sell a lot of copies of that game. And they're mostly concerned about getting that money. So... Um, so from what I found with the data analytic work, the things that sell the best are the things that are most well-rounded. So things that don't have really an apparent weakness and things that are above average all around. And this is something you can also see in like, there's this book and also movie starring Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill called Moneyball, in which uh, it talked about how baseball um, and the recruitment of baseball players. And this is something that was ingrained in recruitment of players way back when. Like the old style of, uh, of picking players was just like picking out players that were consistently the most well-rounded. Not necessarily like the ones that were specialized in any one thing. And that was like the whole interesting, like, let's take a look at the statistics and let's see the results and all that. So going back to sales, it's interesting to see that like, okay, well, these companies have figured out that you don't need to have like five out of five games to produce a lot of sales. You just need it to be super well-rounded and not be like flawed. Because there are going to be people who enjoy it and that's all they care about is like whether or not they enjoy the game. And the number of people who just want to enjoy a game far, far outnumber than the ones who are looking for like a transcendental experience, like their next favorite game. <coughs> <coughs> the problem with that though, in terms of people who actually own a stake in a brand, so like Microsoft with Xbox and Game Pass, is that over time, um, the quality of the games is attached to the brand of it. And uh, the quality is what, uh, when it com comes in terms with comparisons with different um, companies, so like PlayStation and Nintendo, people are going to compare them, find out which one is better, and then pick that one. So in terms of... <coughs> <coughs> Game ratings. Game ratings are usually used for comparisons. And since Microsoft is competing with PlayStation and Nintendo, and eventually, like, I mean, Apple's going to try their hand in making game consoles. And there's no question, like, it's only a matter of time before um, other countries. Um, are going to try their hands at like getting into the video game market by making their own consoles and their own brands. That like uh, Microsoft needed 
just a strong, like, Microsoft needs to be in a place where they uphold having high quality games instead of just puffing out games for money. Anyway, so that's like the big exciting part with them acquiring, um, especially Blizzard games for me, because uh, I do like Blizzard games quite a bit. I think Overwatch is my most played multi uh, multiplayer first person shooter. Mm. Sorry, I was just telling uh, Chicken and sausage gumbo. Let's get to one more chill marathon. Then I might call it after that. Ooh, ritual passion. Ooh, jellyfish chorus. <coughs> Turtle dreams. <coughs> Forest dawn. Yin and yang. Blossoms. Ooh, a soul circle. Mermaid Cove. I'm honestly kind of feeling Mermaid Cove. Right. <coughs> right. Um... I guess what am I hoping for? What's like the best possible scenario that I'm hoping for with the Microsoft acquisition? Huh. I, I really don't have a huge stake in uh, World of Warcraft or MMOs, so I really don't care about that too much. Um. I like Overwatch, so I'm hoping that um, I'm hoping that Overwatch 2 does well. Man, the only thing I did with Overwatch 2, or with Overwatch, like, and don't judge because I think I have like, so I have like maybe 12, anywhere from 1,200 to 1,300 hours in the game. Um. And like, I kid you not, like, it has to be a thousand plus hours, all in like the mystery, uh, the mystery mode. The ones where like you have um, randomized characters whenever you respawn. I think that's that mode's so much fun, and um, I kept on playing it because it was fun, but also because you could. You're able to collect like rewards and everything with the arcade modes. Man, I I remember getting my first um, first person who kind of like yelled at me uh, when I was like just starting out with Overwatch, um, and it was honestly it was it was a little traumatizing at the time because. It was actually a toxic girl gamer, and I. It's not, it was only until later when I actually, like, instead of like playing the game only for like, what, uh, five hours, um, and now having played it for a thousand hours, that I realized how wrong that person was. 
we were playing a <coughs> multiplayer match, it was competitive. And, um, there, I think she was, she was the leader, sort of. She was, like, making decisions, because I think a lot of the other guys on the team were just very interested in being on her good side. You can imagine. And so her, the thing that she wanted to, that she thought was smart, was like, okay, let's only have one DPS uh, versus them, and focus all on um, having tanks. And like, this was definitely on her, because she had, um, I had later looked her up after the match, because I was <laughs> very traumatized by uh, how uh, talks that she got with me. Um, because guess who was assigned to be DPS of that game? The sole DPS of that uh, multiplayer match. Uh, yeah, that was me. Someone who had only played the game for five hours. Um, oh my, this is a nice little song here. <laughs> um, but yeah, she had played that game for like 500 hours by that point. And so she should have known like, how terrible of a decision it is to only have one DPS on a team, as well as uh, give that position to a new player. But yeah, I remember the thing that she yelled at me for was like, oh, you just aren't practicing enough. Um, and I was shocked that, like, no one really stood up for me. Um, it was nice that they didn't join her in yelling at me, but... I felt really bad at that time. So, <coughs> after that, I was like debating whether or not to even play the game anymore, like five hours in. Because even though I like the core gameplay concepts, and <laughs> it's not like I, <coughs> I was a new to first, like multiplayer first person shooters by any means. Like, I had uh, a decent number of hours into like Halo. Halo, one of the battlefields, I can't remember which, and uh, Team Fortress 2. Um, and despite that being the case, like I was really debating whether or not to continue because I, I really don't like toxicity. Um, and then what I just did after that was I decided just to put everybody on mute. Um, and just like not listen to anyone. I tried it, I tried um, one time, and this was like me getting better, so at a time where I'm, I had like maybe uh, 500 hours in onto a game, uh, I remember, I was like, let's just try to see what it's like to hear the people um, talking. And so I, I turned on uh, voices for the other players, and immediately, I hear like one of the guys was like shit talking my player because he knew that I was like I had turned off voices and I was like and at that time since I had it on I was like oh is there a problem and as soon as like he heard my voice like come on he was like oh no no everything's fine I was like holy crap like holy shit like I am own on your stuff right like if you're shit talking to someone like at least own up to it. If you like, like, ideally you don't want to do it at all. Oh my gosh. But like, at least own up to it instead of like, um, it's just instead of just like complaining. Yeah, I think uh, Mystery Heroes was just it was a lot of fun. Um, and I'm a. I, I'm a little bit hesitant on how excited I am for Overwatch 2 because like, I don't know what they can actually do for that game to make it a lot more um, exciting compared to the first. Um, I think you would have to honestly like make a lot of changes to uh, some of the core mechanics to get more options to the players. but. Part of what makes Overwatch good is just like, it's like a really simple, it's like a really simple, you know, first person shooter, but there's a lot of options there. There's a lot of options, there's a lot of variety. Um, 
guess I guess maybe one of their strategies could be to instead of like chaining things up just try to attract a bigger audience so they get like enough people gosh that might go to last too much Um, in terms of games I'm excited about, um, I don't really think that there is anything that I'm super gung ho about. Um, I talked about this with my friend, and we were really big Legend of Zelda fans. Um, I still think like Wind Waker was such a huge, had such a huge impact on me, and Twilight Princess was just a fantastic follow up. Like. Um, for people who really enjoy the Ocarina of Time style Legend of Zelda, it's like Wind Waker and Twilight Princess were like they were like peak Zelda game design, honestly. Um, and so um, <coughs> the new Breath of the Wild, um, it's definitely uh, exciting. But um, I'm not like I'm not over the moon about it because I, personally I just don't like the open world design compared to um, compared to like the puzzle puzzle design and like um, like level designs or, like specific level design. Um, Old school Zelda's. Uh, Odyssey, I think, is amazing. Uh, that's like one of the newer Nintendo games where I'm like, you know, Bravo did a really good job. Um, <coughs> yeah, like right now, <coughs> I'm just having a nice time just playing some of the older games um, <coughs> that I just never got a chance. <laughs> A chance to play. Oh my gosh! Um, never got a chance to play with uh, just timing and everything. So playing on um, Xbox, like the Game Pass or the PC Game Pass, which is, I guess what I have. Um, it's been a real treat, honestly. Um, Just kind of like end my misery game and end my misery. There's not too much I can do here. Um, Appreciate um, everyone watching the VOD. Um, I had a lot of fun just talking about this stuff, kind of rambling on, but this was a real fun stream. <laughs>